guys, welcome to SciFair Christian Church Online. We are so glad that you're joining us today from your living rooms, from your kitchens, from your dining rooms. Welcome, and we hope today that you're encouraged, that you're challenged, that you're lifted up by worshiping with your friends and worshiping the one and only uh, worthy of our praise. You may notice that I'm coming to you from my house and not from the sanctuary. And that's because our live streaming equipment is still being adjusted and tweaked. So it is the best live streaming experience for you possible. So we're not going to be live streaming from our sanctuary today, but we will be soon and you are going to love it. I want to remind you that there's just a, a few things um, that you can interact with here today during the service. If you need prayer, you can, uh, you can request live prayer with one of our prayer partners and they'd be happy to pray with you. Uh, you can uh, also email us, prayer at sciferchristian.org if you'd like to, to receive prayer. Our um, prayer partners, our elders and our pastors will be praying for you. Um, you can also give online and you can give through our app. You can give by going to our website or you can give by clicking on the button in the chat. Uh, lots of different ways to interact with one another. We hope that today that you are encouraged and that you are challenged to live more like Jesus. Thank you for joining us and uh, we hope that you have a great day.
just saw 200 faces. We all have one thing in common. Uh, they, just like you and me, were all created in the image of God. Guys, as I think back over the past few decades, I would have to say that the clarion call of our culture, often to the church, is judge not. Judge not. Today we're going to be looking at uh, a few verses of Scripture in Matthew chapter 6. Um, we continue our series, Counterculture, and we um, will be diving into verse 1. Jesus said, Judge not that you be not judged. Judge not that you be not judged. Now, guys, um, quite honestly, these verses have often by, been used by those who want it to or want to condemn anyone who speaks truth about what they believe is right or wrong, good or evil. Very quickly, society will say, judge not. I want us to think about the word in this passage, judge. Uh, it is very uh, broad um, in um, the way it is interpreted. It can mean anything um, from discern, discern, to judge critically, to judge judicially, as in not one of our courts, but standing over someone as their final authority and judge. It can also mean um, to judge judicially and condemn. I believe this passage specifically refers to condemning judgment. One translator translates the passage like this, do not pass judgment on others, do not specifically, do not adopt a critical spirit, a condemning attitude. Paul writes in, in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 14, Chapter 14, verse 10, he writes these words. Same interpretation. I believe it directly correlates to our passage today. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat. Of God. For as it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. Obviously, each of us, whether we're followers of Jesus or not followers of Jesus, we have one authoritative judge in our life ultimately. Uh, we will be judged by God. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. In this passage, we're going to see two types of judgment. We're going to see condemning judgment, which Jesus prohibits, and we're going to see discerning judgment, which Jesus encourages. Guys, as followers of Jesus, when we are faced with good, when we're faced with um, evil, when we're faced with right, when we're faced with wrong, we do not check our brains in at the door. We're not to, content to condemn, but we are um, to exercise discernment. 
Well, let's look at this passage in uh, Matthew 7 a little further. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now guys, there is no doubt um, that when, when we pour out harsh judgment, when we act like we're the uh, judge, jury, and executioner, that people will be harsh to us. In fact, when we acted like the superior authority on life, people actually love to see us fail. They love to criticize us with the same severity we criticize them. Key principle. Key principle. As a follower of Jesus, I must not engage in condemning judgment. Guys, this really does parallel with some scenarios, um, with some instructions, with some insight that Jesus has already provided us in the Sermon on the Mount. Um, first of all, we see in Matthew 5, 7, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. As we've said over and over again, this is a not a tit-for-tat relationship where we do something and God rewards us with something. In fact, the very definition of mercy prohibits that. Mercy means unmerited, unearned favor. So what does this mean? I just want to remind you. What it means is we have received mercy, and because we have received mercy, we then are conduits of mercy to others. It actually verifies that we've uh, experienced real mercy. We've received mercy, we show mercy to others, and ultimately, we stand under God's mercy. The same is true um, concerning forgiveness. We just have looked at this recently. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. What does it mean? Tit for tat? Not at all. We experience the forgiveness of God. There is no way for us not then to show forgiveness. Well, I guess there is a way for us not to show forgiveness, but we're not living or walking as a follower of Christ. If we are not forgiven, uh, forgiving people, it betrays the fact of whether we have actually received forgiveness. We've received forgiveness as followers of Jesus, we show forgiveness, and ultimately we will stand under forgiveness. Why am I talking about mercy and forgiveness? Because the absolute same thing applies to this passage. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. D.A. Carson writes these words. The point of these two verses is not that we should be moderate in our judging in order that others will be moderate toward us, but rather that we should abolish judgmental attitudes lest we ourselves stand utterly condemned before God. A judgmental attitude, or you might say a condemning person, excludes us from God's pardon for it betrays an unbroken Spirit. You see, guys, if we cannot show mercy to people, 
If we stand in condemning judgment towards others, it betrays the fact, it questions the fact, whether we've ever experienced God's true mercy. Instead of recognizing that we no longer stand under judgment because God judged Christ in our place, we continue to judge people as we, as we think we are um, the judge, the jury, and the executioner. Jesus illustrates this very well um, with a picture he paints. He says, why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye. Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite! First take the law out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Guys, Jesus, Jesus does not require us to be blind to others' sin. He does not require us to be blind to that which is in someone else's eye. He requires us to be generous. Why is it? that we so easily see what one author describes as the peccadilloes, the small offenses in someone else's life, while at the same time we cannot see the huge offenses in our own life. Guys, it's because we're fallible. We sin. We are not just fallible. We are fallen people. And that disqualifies us from standing in the judge's place, sitting at the judge's bench, and acting like we are the ultimate judge in someone's life. There's a great story that illustrates this in God's word. If you remember David, his armies were off at war, and he was on his rooftop, I'm sure of his magnificent home, in his palace, and he looks and sees another woman, a naked woman, on her rooftop. He asks for her to come to his home. He seduces her. He's a man of great power, a man of great influence. After he seduces her, soon after that, uh, it is found out that she is pregnant. He finds out she's pregnant. He resorts to getting her husband um, to come home from battle, hoping um, that he will um, celebrate the fact that he's home with his wife. But he refuses to. He says, how can I spend this time with my wife whenever the armies of Israel are off at battle? David's first plan does not work, so he contacts the, the general over Israel's forces, and he says, I want you to put Bathsheba's husband on the front lines. And he did, and Bathsheba's husband lost his life. Listen to this story. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there are two men in a certain there were two men in a certain city the one rich and the other poor the rich man had very many flocks and herds but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had bought and he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms it was a pet and it was like a daughter to him. 
Now there came a traveler to the rich um, to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he has done this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are that man. Guys, just think about the story. David has this huge offense in his life. Especially when compared to what the um, rich man did. It's even a worse offense. But David could not see his terrible offense. He definitely could identify with someone else's terrible offense. I mean, a, a gross injustice. He could see the sins of others, but he could not see his own sins. He was ready to condemn the other man, but he did not stand and condemn his own sin. He stood in judgment on others, but he didn't look in the mirror and judge himself. Now guys, there's one facet of this story that I think seldom is mentioned. David, David is involved in condemning judgment. Nathan is involved in discerning judgment. You say, no, he's not. He condemned David. Oh, he speaks the word of God, but he speaks the word of God because he's calling out right is right, Wrong is wrong. That's what the prophets of God did. And guys, as the people of God today, we cannot skirt the responsibility of discerning judgment. That is our second principle today. As a follower of Jesus, I must engage in discerning judgment. In fact, Jesus illustrates this in the verses that immediately follow, um, judge not that you be not judged. In verse 6, Jesus said, Do not give dogs what is holy, and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Now guys, what Jesus is telling them not to do requires discerning judgment. Now I just want to warn you, there's one verse in this passage concerning discerning judgment. There's five verses concerning condemning judgment. We are not to engage in condemning judgment, but in regard to certain people at certain times, based on certain actions, we are to perform, engage in discerning judgment. Jesus compares those who would trample underfoot the treasure of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He calls them dogs. Guys, he's not talking about Izzy, my pet. He's talking about vicious animals. We would say feral dogs, filthy dogs. They fed at the garbage dumps outside of town. He's not talking about Arnold, um, the pig, who is quite friendly. He is talking about the feral hogs that infest our state, infest our farmland, that are destructive. And he says, if you cast your pearls before them, they will trample them underfoot. Do not waste the truth of the gospel on those who have rejected it, 
on those who will belittle it, on those who trample it underfoot. Jesus goes on in this chapter, we won't look at the verse, but he goes on to speak of people he calls wolves. Wolves in sheep's clothing. That takes discerning judgment to see a wolf in sheep's clothing. Who are these wolves? False teachers. We have to assess what someone's teaching We have to determine that it is false. We do so by looking at God's Word. We do so by being a part of a community of faith. We do so by listening to the Spirit's voice. We exercise discernment, and we must speak out against false teachers. Guys, judge not so that you be not judged, does not, does not limit or do away with our responsibility to speak truth to brothers in Christ who are going their own way. They once walked with Jesus, but now they follow their way, a way they've chosen to their own destruction. Listen to what Jesus says. Jesus says to his disciples, he says to them that in Matthew chapter 18, if a, your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained a brother. Guys, that's discerning judgment. You are pointing out a fault, an area of sin, an area of wrong, maybe even an area of evil in a brother's life. Jesus said it's your responsibility. And if you do that, uh, you've restored a relationship, you've won a brother. The Apostle Paul says, Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is called in any transgression, you who are spiritual, again, you're identifying a wrong, you're identifying somewhere where a person's turned from the truth, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, but don't be arrogant, don't be proud, keep watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. One of the early church fathers writes this, Correct him, but not as a foe, nor as an adversary exacting a penalty, engaging in condemning judgment. No, exercise discerning judgment. Not as a foe, nor as an adversary, but as a physician providing medicines. Guys, I've already indicated how, how in the world can we speak truth to someone? What gives us that right? God's Word, God's Spirit, and God's community. You know, if I really am questioning the truth I see in God's Word, or what I think the Holy Spirit saying to me, I gather with leaders, with other brothers in Christ, and we compare notes to see if we believe we're in line with the Word of God. Guys, God's Word's not popular. In a culture whose clarion call is judge not that you be not judged... It's not popular. But as we said in the beginning, every single person I will ever look eye to eye with is valuable. They are created in the image of God. I treat them with discerning judgment. I do not write them off. I do not condemn them. I love them. It's Christ Jesus loved me. 
You want to hear an uncomfortable passage? Especially in our culture? A passage that is true? Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor the revilers, nor swindlers, will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. I was an idolater before coming to Christ. In some ways, all of us were, were because we put other things before God. Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. How were we transformed? How did we who deserve condemnation and judgment enter a relationship with God? There's only one way, through faith in Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 6, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. All of us. Don't stand in condemning judgment on others. That list of sins, sure there are some social sins that people will be offended that you say are wrong. But guys, there are sins in that list that some of you are offended and it pricks your heart when you hear them because we know we're wrong. Every one of us have gone astray, but... The Lord has laid on Him the iniquity of us all. Christ was condemned in our place. 1 Peter 2.24 He Himself bore our sins in His body on the tree. He was condemned that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By His wounds you have been healed. John 5, 24. Beautiful passage. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. From death to life. The truth of the matter is, guys, if we do not acknowledge God's condemning judgment in our life, we can never enter into His kingdom. You see, it was at a time and point in my life when my eyes were open to my sin. My eyes were open to the fact I deserved it. And the fact that God loved me so much, He sent His Son to die for me. It does not matter what your sin is. Jesus was condemned in your place. We are all the same in that way. The question is, will we admit our sin, that we've chosen our way over God's way, and will we place our faith in Christ, who died, that we might pass from death to life. What a beautiful way. What beautiful passages to prepare our hearts for communion.
peace be still calm this soul I need you here now restore my hope I confess I've been afraid remind my heart Lord increase my faith so I I want to thank you again uh, for joining us online for worship. You know, we might not be together in the same room, um, but we are still one body in Christ. You know, I look forward to the day we're all in the same room, um, but until that day comes, we're going to continue to lift up the name of Jesus as one body in Christ. You know, as I think about um, those words, judge not so that you will not be judged, um, I, I just want to be clear again, uh, we're not to engage in condemning judgment. We are to engage in discerning judgment. Engaging in discerning judgment is not easy. It's always challenging. It's challenging when we put the mirror to our life and have to admit 
our wrongs, our sins. It's challenging when we um, shine the light of God's Word on our culture and are honest about something that's wrong that the society says is not wrong. Um, I hope we struggle. There should be no arrogance. All of us were lost at one time. I just want to make it clear. You know how I expect lost people to live? Like they're lost. We're not calling them to change morality. We're calling them to the good news of Jesus Christ. Jesus is all of our answer to the challenges of life. You know, it's counterintuitive, but judge not so that you will not be judged isn't just about others. It's about looking on our own lives in condemnation with condemning judgment. Do not live under the cloud of judgment. Jesus Christ was judged in your place. Live in the freedom that comes from the grace of Jesus Christ. Paul writes, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. How much condemnation? None. No condemnation. Celebrate the grace of God. Do not um, engage in condemning judgment. Lean in to struggle with discerning judgment. But celebrate the gospel. We want to thank you for joining us for worship today. And I encourage you to share the service with your friends. Uh, share it on social media, email them, text them. God is using this time to draw people to Him and you may be the person that introduces them to their Savior for the first time. So be bold and share our services with your friends. For some of you out there, you may be hearing about Jesus for the first time and you've been looking for something to satisfy your heart, satisfy your soul your whole life and I promise you that Jesus is the answer. Jesus will satisfy you. He will bring you peace. He will bring you hope. And if you're watching with us online, you can commit your life to Jesus and one of our pastors will contact you and pray with you. We would love to do that. And so if you want to, please commit your life to Jesus here today. Some of you may need prayer and uh, I encourage you to not to hesitate to send your prayer requests to prayer at cypherchristian.org. Our elders, our pastors, our prayer partners want to be praying for you. Uh, again, we thank you for being here and worshiping with us. As many have said throughout the service, that we are part, we are uh, being bound by the blood of Jesus. And I believe that God's purpose is still being fulfilled even though the church is scattered right now, maybe even in a more powerful way. And uh, so this is a, an exciting time for the church. I wanna close with this one final benediction before we go. This is Romans chapter 15, verse 13, and Paul, Paul says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. God bless you guys, and have a great day.